Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, let it start here. Lamb chop, steak free. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. First thing you think when you hit central Tokyo, you think Blade Runner. It's very science fiction. It's very atmospheric. You really know you're somewhere else. This is far from home. I knew the kind of kaleidoscope full of color and light and flavor I'd find here. I'm really looking forward to the psychedelic assault on the senses. I'm very interested in eating my way through the full spectrum of Japanese cuisine. I think almost all modern chefs are impressed by Japanese presentation, the importance of contrasting textures, colors, and portion size. Embodying all these traits is Japan's best known contribution to world cuisine, sushi. Very violent dreams last night. You know, full color, sound, increased heart rate, and woke up uh, thinking of sushi. I'm particularly fortunate that my liaisons here are Michiko and Shinji. Michiko translates and has, and in every way, paved the way for uh, the ignorant but enthusiastic American. And Shinji, driving, uh, translating, and thank God he's a Yankee fan, so I know I'm in good hands. All right. We're on our way to meet an Edamai sushi master who's going to show us around Tokyo's central fish market, Tsukiji. Edamai sushi is high-end stuff, not just because it's pricey, which it is, but because of the uncompromising quality, preparation, and presentation involved. Yeah, it translates like Edomai. What, what does that mean, literally? Edomai, Edo is uh, the name of the period of the ancient Japan. Okay, so it, it really does mean old style, classic yeah, version. Yeah, classic version, yeah. Sushi is just like cutting fish and right. it's just it's fresh. It together. But just Edomai is they need lots of preparation. Edamai preparation standards are not sushi on the go. Absolutely uncompromising on quality, regardless of expense. It's purest sushi. Hello. Hello. I'm very pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. Anthony Brady. I'm fortunate enough during this visit to Sakiji to accompany Mr. Tugawa, the chef owner of Karaku Restaurant in Ginza District. I have my appropriate footwear, of course, right here. <laughs> this is sort of like Joe DiMaggio or Lou Gehrig showing you around Yankee Stadium. From the point that it practically leaps out of the sea to the point where I pop it in my mouth, Mr. Tagawa will be by my side. <laughs> Prepare to lose your mind. I mean, just lift off. Your head will just unscrew and bounce off the ceiling. Tsukiji is acres and acres of fish, fish, fish. Restaurants, retail store owners, and other buyers are purchasing fish for the day. Over 2,600 tons of fish is sold here daily. That's a big tuna sandwich. First thing you encounter when you visit Tsukiji is big. It's really big. It's really spread out, and the choreography has to be seen to be believed. There's a system here. Everybody seems to know the moves, except me. Mr. Tagawa is gonna, we're gonna follow him around as he does his shopping, and then we're going back to his restaurant, and he's gonna show us uh, what he's gonna do with this stuff. You know, there are a few things that get chefs as excited as looking at a really pristine piece of seafood. Abalone, about $40 a piece in the States. Oh, uh, liver? Liver, yeah. I don't want to see eel, eel. Yeah, the, he can show you the sea eel, the different kinds of the, the eel that we want to eat. 
Eel is an expensive delicacy in Japan, prized not just for its flavor, but for its legendary, how shall I say, stamina-giving properties. Viagra of the sea. It looks tasty to me. Having picked out his eels, Mr. Tagawa is now ready to move on to his next purchase. See the octopus? Just incredible. I just want to start weeping. Generally, in the life of a chef, you find yourself working comfortably with a certain range of flavors and textures. And then suddenly, you see all this. Immediately, you want to rush back to your kitchen to find a way to work with what you've just bought. This octopus is holding on for dear life. He's got a death grip on the tank. As excited as I am, the Japanese who live here seem just as excited. Okay, here we go. Say goodbye. Seafood is taken very, very seriously here. This has got a strange and terrible beauty to it. Value is put on good food. To us, food is worthless until somebody famous puts a sauce on it. It's not that way here. There's a respect for ingredients that goes against the grain of a lot of Western cooking. One widely used ingredient is the much revered tuna. So what are we looking for here? What is Mr. Tagawa looking for? It's explained this is the fattiest part, the most valued part. We call it Toro. It's gorgeous. Big difference, Toro and everything else. It's the equivalent of a beautifully marbled steak. Fat is good, and the rippling of fat through the meat is what distinguishes that belly meat from the rest of the tuna. You get that same feeling of being a Tiffany or Cartier. I mean, you just look at this with, with lust. And, and, you know, just the subtle difference. It's like grading gems. It's fought over, bid over, talked about, and examined. And you can see, they're very, they're very different pieces with very different qualities. And when you're a chef, you come down here and you see this, you're thinking, you know, what, what you can do with these various pieces. I can hardly wait to see what Mr. Tagawa is going to do with this stuff. You know, what's a bit in Apocalypse Now? You know, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I love the smell of fish and soy and uh, rice wine in the morning. It smells like victory. I'm always very wary of stepping into other chefs' kitchens. Hi. Hi. It's an obstruction. I'm instantly aware, chemically, on a cellular level, when, you know, there are interlopers in my kitchen. Despite his resistance, the octopus still ends up in Mr. Tagawa's kitchen. At least he can take solace in the fact that ending your life here is a great honor. I have some Portuguese friends who would just go insane over this. And some Italians. Now they're going to put salt. Salt is rubbed into the octopus to bring out the excess moisture as well as add flavor. There's so many th good things you can do with this. I mean, I'm thinking you can grill it, you know, make a salad of it grilled, you can make a salad of it, uh, you know, slowly stewed. I understand that Mr. Tagawa is using his octopus for a special appetizer. Tenderizing. At the sushi bar, Tagawa's chefs are busy making magic with the fresh fish from Tsukiji, including the eel. Sounds fresh. Even with my, with my eyes closed, it sounds fresh. And I'm thinking, nice knife technique. You do not see this level of knife skills in, in French kitchens. Despite the dazzling knife work, this eel is not ready to eat yet. He boils 20 minutes. It's sugar. A lot of sugar. And then soy sauce. And just sake, the rice wine. 
Mr. Tagawa begins working with the best of the good stuff. Otoro. This is the, this is the piece uh, that we saw him pick out of the market. And he's breaking it into components. The boss always takes a proprietary interest in not only the most expensive stuff, but also the stuff that gives him the most pleasure. At first, you tell, you tell yourself, well, it's because I don't trust anyone else to handle something this beautiful and this expensive. And then you realize, you know, I'm doing it because I like it. Mr. Tagawa now divides the tuna into smaller pieces for sushi. The lesser grade fish goes into a marinade, and the really good stuff gets put aside for immediate use in its pristine, fresh form. I'm experiencing a pleasurable form of dementia. Look at that, that's sex, man. Finally, the meal's ready. Michiko, Shinji, and I sit down to eat. Okay, come by. Our appetizer is slowly simmered octopus. It's very tender and served with just a dash of sweet plum sauce. The skin is melting. Mm. Spectacular. As we're eating the appetizer, Mr. Tagawa himself is preparing our main dish. Pieces of uncooked fish, vinegared rice, and fresh wasabi are molded smoothly together. While this is the most commonly known form of sushi, in the exacting standards of the Edomai tradition, it takes a lifetime to master the economy and grace of movement necessary to make an artful presentation. An elite sushi chef like Mr. Tagawa trains for more than 12 years. Oh, man. I was going to say that I'm ready to die right now, but no, I'll be ready to die after this. <laughs> OK, what do we have here? Flounder. Flounder, yes. Yeah. Shrimp or prawn? Prawn. Prawn. Yeah. And? Tuna. Tuna. Not They're just tuna, no, this is otoro. Otoro part of tuna. Also on the plate are marinated tuna and raw eel. <laughs> Don't you just explain, you know? How can I explain? Oh, wow. Yeah, this I know what that is. That's uh, that's a seal. You know, you're struck dumb. I mean, it's almost you're you're cheapening the thing by talking about it. Hi, <laughs> Domo. So I have a glazed expression on my face. It's a sh pure pleasure. Thank you. Now, would you like to do the apprenticeship here? <laughs> I, w yes. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> long, time. While I was refusing Mr. Tagawa's generous offer, he still had one very important lesson on the menu. I'm ready to die now. I will have led a full and rich and satisfied life uh, at this point. Japanese people consider the sake as a sacred man. Supporting sake shows like a, his affection, his friendship, you know, his like a hospitality. Hi. It's very important in the Japanese culture. More please. And also you pour it back. And it's your turn to pour it back. Thank you. Thank you very much. The religious analogy keeps coming up. There's something church-like, at least for me. Thank you. There's a sense of solemnity here. There's no nonsense. There's no distraction. I would, uh, Nothing I fake about it. Church of food. I mean, it's the only church I know. Very cold, iced sake. You get that ice cream headache sort of thing. And you feel it on your tongue first, and then it works its way up into your brain. Thank you. Thank you for one of the most incredible dining experiences of my life. I will be always grateful. Me too. Leaving Mr. Tagawa's restaurant, I'm feeling that my New York fast food, fast paced culture has missed the boat. For us, uh, restaurants were like gas stations. You know, you pull in, you fill up, and you move on, preferably as quickly as possible. The idea of volume was much more important than, than quality, you know. Hey, did you have a good meal? Yeah, they gave you, you know, all the shrimp you could eat. You know, that's not a. I mean, that's really silly. You know, bulk, I mean, it, it explains a lot about our culture. Speaking of bulk, 
check these guys out. It happens that I have come into a one-time opportunity to visit a sumo wrestling stable, the gym and home of the team. And here I come, I know nothing about sumo, and uh, I exude ignorance. Watching the sumo wrestlers train, this is like being led into a secret society. Sumo is serious business in Japan, something outsiders just aren't allowed to see. They're not kidding in there. These guys are really going at each other. Some of them get tossed out of the ring. They come rolling right at me. I don't want one of these guys landing on me. No way. They'll break me like a day-old biscuit. The feeling of being surrounded by that much bulk. I mean, what do these guys eat? I'm interested in what I heard is sumo food. Chanko, it's called. I'm thinking, well, how on Japanese this sounds? must be bulk food, you know, high on starch. You know, I had this idea of, you know, they're sitting around eating pasta and big, you know, massive hunks of fatty pork. I'm very lucky to be introduced to Mr. Tomatsuna of Tomatsuna Stable. Tomatsuna is a former champion himself. Today, he's an Oyakata, which is the boss of the sumo stable. All of the wrestlers live on premises. What they eat, when they eat, these are all very rigorously dictated by the Oyakata, who completely controls their lives. He cooks for them, looks after their training, their health, in a quest to make them the best. He's an old lion, and um, he pretty much uh, saw me as an insignificant curiosity, I think. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm determined to find out the secret diet of the sumo. The, the wrestlers have a tremendous uh, power. Um, the, the food that he selects uh, must uh, uh, reflect the need for, for this power. He says that I mean, people tend to think that sumo resta is just a fat. It's not true. Actually, like, they need a balance of the energy and the balance of the weight. Do all the wrestlers learn to cook as part of yeah, their training? Right. Yes. Or behaved a lot in, in much the same way uh, five years ago if you'd walk into my kitchen and wanted to talk to my cooks. Uh, fiercely protective. It's one pot cooking. A lot of guys living together cook in one pot. The food is not about, you know, just getting these guys big. We're not here building blubber. He's clearly wrong in this. Uh, he's looking for a balance of, you know, protein and, uh, you know, bodybuilding food. Unfortunately, that's all I'm able to find out at this kitchen anyway. It's going to take a trip to a Chenko restaurant to experience the sumo diet firsthand. After a full day of watching sumo wrestlers train, I'm definitely ready to eat like one. We're going to have a Chenko meal. And I'm hungry. You hungry? I'm starving. Excellent. Chenko is the food of the sumo and the specialty of Chenko at Osawa restaurant. Immediately, it becomes obvious the secret to eating like a sumo isn't in the fat, but in the quantity. It's a nabe, like a big soup, a big boiling pot of broth in the center of the table. Everybody adds something. You add things in stages. Originally, the chanko was made of the chicken soup. Nowadays, they cook you know, everything. Beef, chicken, meatballs, seafood, mushrooms, green vegetables, tofu, onions, radishes, egg, rice, you can use it all. And we are. And of course, it's like a, the nabe style, which is a pot, right. in, in order to provide the hot meal for the rikishi, who is, which is a wrestler. Right. So you can see the, the taste of the soup is changing yes. gradually. I really had no idea what to expect. One of the first surprises is that chanko is fun, sort of like a living dish, in that as the conversation proceeds and the subject matter changes, the character of the dish can change as well. It can start out fairly light, but you can add stronger ingredients. And of course, as it cooks down, it becomes stronger as well. Well, I like that, but it is spicy. It's really good, it's really hearty, um, and I really like the style of uh, of, of, uh, of cooking and the style of eating. I mean, this is fun, it's casual. We all sit around, we all put stuff in, we all take stuff out, serve each other. I think Michiko and Shinji take particular delight. Their whole countenance has changed during the course of this meal. I feel honored to be served. Ah. <laughs> but 
about a friendship and oh. just having a chanko. That's fun. I like yeah. this. For such an almost cult-like closed society of sumo, their food is perhaps the most accessible to the everyday American. I mean, I can see Chanko taking off in the United States. <laughs> I know how he feels. <laughs> I'm well on my way. <laughs> From the precision and restraint of Edamai Sushi to the volume and bulk of Chanko in a 24-hour period. Eating my way around the world, it would be intimidating, I think, if it just wasn't so exciting. I think it's going to take about a week to walk off this meal.